Hi, I'm Don Marisa Lace with NS2022, and I am here today with Samuel Levine. He is a lawyer, an author, a professor. He founded Disability Rights and Inclusion Project. He, he just really loves to participate and uh, benefit the space of neurodiversity. Um, does talks, is just really out there trying to improve things. One of the first things that attracted me to Samuel was I caught the title of one of your books. You have written a book looking at the, uh, uh, depending on your viewpoint, the biblical character, the historical figure of uh, Yeshua, uh, um, and whether or not he might have been autistic. And that just lit up my world. Um, <laughs> I thought that was such a wonderful thing. And, you know, we're not going to focus very much on that because not everybody has that uh, biblical knowledge or or cares to talk about it. But someday you and I really need to have that conversation and share it with the world because I just find that so much fun about you. Thank you so much. And just to make the point, you know, this is the biblical Yosef that I, I use the Hebrew in the title. Joseph, that many have heard of, son of Jacob. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I got the name wrong. Thank you. Yeah. And whether, you know, you've heard of the story through the Bible, through the Broadway play, through the DreamWorks animation, you know, I think this is a story that people are familiar with, and by all means, I welcome the opportunity to discuss that further with you. Yeah, the, it, it's just an idea that I love. Um, and then when you and I started talking, you shared with me that, you know, part of the point was autism is not new. Autism is, has always been with us. We're just only now barely beginning to understand the reality of it. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, and I just want to say, just as an introduction, what a pleasure it is to work with you and how important your work is. And it's an honor to be able to participate in the efforts that you are doing uh, with so many others. Um, I'm looking forward to keeping that conversation going. When it comes to autism, we're talking about the neurotype. When we talk about neurodiversity, we're talking about a neurotype, a reality of people being different, and people are different in all sorts of ways, and people have always been different in all sorts of ways. And again, without focusing on the book itself, the idea that jumped out at me is that if you read the Bible, thousands of year old book, if you read literature and there's all kinds of conversations and suggestions about different figures in literature, different historical figures, it really does jump out at you if you take a close look that many individuals over the years, some very prominent individuals, some heroes, some regular people like the rest of us, had characteristics that very much resemble, are very consistent with our contemporary understandings of autism and neurodiversity. And in my research, to take this a step further, what I found was that in looking not only at the biblical text, but in looking at some of the commentaries and in the Jewish tradition, the exegetical tradition, we study the text, thousands of years old, with commentators across the world from different points in history who offer their own insights into the text, forms of literary interpretation. And guess what? They made comments as well, which said to me, which suggested at least to me, that they, in their own experiences, observe these types of behaviors. They've seen this neurotype on their own, they obviously didn't use the word autism. They obviously didn't use the word neurodiversity, which is a word that is not familiar, I'd say, to most people in the United States you know, to this day. But they did use terminology and descriptions of certain behaviors, of social interactions, of both skills and talents and abilities that, in Joseph's case, he demonstrates. And again, if you're at all familiar with the story, those kind of jump out at you. And at the same time, some of the, call them deficits, challenges, social interactions that he had some trouble with. And to be fair, that others had trouble with him. And those types of interactions were with us. They will always be with us. And we are now coming to this understanding through the notion of neurodiversity, through the notion of understanding, acceptance, inclusion of autistic individuals, we're understanding that, you know what, we can navigate these differences and we can move forward. One of the things I really appreciate about what you just said is that um, 
being able to look at a historical figure and think about what their brain wiring might have been, right? Uh, when it comes to historical figures, often we're looking at their successes, right? We have a, a pretty good uh, bet that Einstein was autistic, but we think of Einstein as, you know, the father of modern physics, and we, you know, we, we think of him in very positive terms. Um, but yet, societally, socially, our our sort of joint concept of autism and other uh, neurodivergent neurotypes tends to be uh, looked at from a disability or a disease perspective, at least for the least pathology. Um, and so we're not looking at uh, at the at the successes and the possibilities and the not to be ableist, but what is someone able to do? Um, we're often approaching this topic from hardships and and difficulties and things like that. And you know, one of the things we're trying to do at Innis is sort out are these difficulties uh, legitimate to the person, or are they imposed by a culture, a society, an environment that does not make proper room for them? You mentioned just before we started recording that you you were part of a panel today where you were talking about employment. Um, do you want to share a little bit about what that conversation was? Well, sure. Um, and neurodiversity and employment is one of many, and there are many areas of importance, and I know you're touching upon many of them, um, several different areas. And this particular webinar did focus on employment because that's an area where I think as a society, at least as an American society, in my experience, um, I think we're getting somewhere, long ways to go, but I think we're getting somewhere, let's say, in the school system. When it comes to special education, an area I've been very involved in, I think we are making strides and understanding autistic children and other areas of special education and properly providing the supports that are necessary. Um, long ways to go again. I could talk all day about the negative, but let's focus on the positive that we've made in the school systems, in the educational system. The next step is when students, once children, are now going into young adults and they age out of the school system. And whether it's 17, 18, or 21, it is usually about the end of the time that the school systems are responsible um, for the now adults, young adults or you know, adults at age of 21, what happens next? As the transitional stage where society has not properly responded and we have an even longer way to go. And that's why employment is so important. There are many individuals who are neurodivergent, who want to be employed, who can be employed, who have abilities to offer. And I just want to make the point, you know, we talk about Einstein, we talk about Biblical Joseph, we don't want to have stereotype or overshoot or overpromise. you know, not every autistic person is going to be an Einstein, neither are you, well, I won't speak to you, but neither am I. Um, but everyone has something to offer and different levels of abilities, different levels of skills, different support needs, we get that as well. But we're not even there in society. Society all too often, and this was a conversation in today's webinar, if a job candidate says the wrong thing in the interview, and I wanna emphasize when we talk about the wrong thing, it's actually the right thing, but saying it in the wrong way, right? So yeah, the famous interview question when they say, what are your weaknesses? And you're supposed to say, Oh, my weaknesses are, I'm a perfectionist. My weaknesses is I work too hard. My weaknesses is I'll cover for someone else. Those aren't weaknesses. You aren't really telling the interviewer your weakness. You're telling what the interviewer wants to hear and you're pretending you're actually praising yourself. So you're saying the right thing in a way, or you're saying the wrong thing because it's not true or it's not really a weakness, but you're saying it in the right way. And we have the reverse when it comes to many neurodivergent candidates when they're asked, well, your weaknesses, they sometimes, and I don't want to stereotype, but they sometimes are very honest because that's often the nature of neurodivergent individuals. And they'll say, oh, weaknesses, I'm glad you asked. Well, I could use some extra time to process some of the things. I could use instructions broken down step by step. I could use a written agenda. That would be really helpful for me. And the interviewer's thinking, that's not the right answer, but it is. It's the exact right answer. It's just said in the wrong way. 
given the expectations of the interview process. So that's an area where we just haven't gotten to that point yet. And to take it one step further, if I may, if an employer speaks to someone, an interviewer, asks a question, and the candidate gives a candid answer, well, that's wonderful. That's something that the interviewer should embrace because now you're understanding who it is that you're thinking of hiring, not someone who's making something up, not someone who's praising himself improperly. So of all things, it's actually the candidate who's being more blunt, being more honest, who's often the better candidate. Now, again, I don't want to claim every autistic person can do every job. You have to make sure the match is okay. But let's get to that stage where they're given a fair chance because the interviewer or the employer is really looking for someone to fill that job and not just looking for someone who's going to say all the right things, but then when it comes to doing the job, they're not going to be the right person for that position. So one of the things that I think is starting to happen is that those of us who are like me, who didn't understand their neurodivergent identity until they were adults, right? I didn't know until I was 50. Some of us are starting to know how our brains are wired and we're starting to tell people. And because of that, we're starting to recognize, no, every autistic person cannot do every job because not every human being can do everything, right? That's not unique to autism. However, there are autistic people ADHD folks, Tourette's folks, there are neurodivergent people in every occupation. We just may not have always recognized them. They may not have always recognized themselves. And so um, I think one of the things that we are now beginning to uh, see is a challenge to some of the perspectives that um, if we can make room for different types of communication. For example, you ask me, what are your weaknesses? I'll go immediately to work to find things I think are weaknesses because honesty is a top level need in my life. And I can get really stuck by, I'm pretty sure you don't want the honest answer. And now what do I do? <laughs> so I can hesitate. And I don't regulate my face as well when I'm deep in thought, right? So a number of things can go wrong for me in an interview uh, that don't speak to whether or not I'm a good candidate. They speak to whether or not that very specific environment is good for me. And it's an interesting way to hire people because we put people through tests that almost have nothing to do with the work that we're trying to get them to do. It's so funny you say that. I, I sometimes say that if the job is, you know, to be, let's say, a political spokesperson, you know, and if you ever look, the presidential spokesperson gets up on the podium and they spin everything, right? They're not supposed to tell the truth because the truth is so scary that they're supposed to cover it up, supposed to say it a different way. But if that's your job, then exactly. If you can interview well, you have that job. But as you said, any other job, if your job is going to be doing coding or if your job is going to be doing something artistic or if your job is going to be dealing with people in a meaningful, professional, honest way, well, then you don't necessarily want someone who's going to be able to spin things. And every time they're asked a question, they try to say it in a way that they think the listener wants to hear, but it's not accurate. It's not really helpful and it's not going to be beneficial. I've, I've worked in different you know, uh, offices, I've worked in different settings, and you need the truth. You need someone to tell you what's going on. And if time after time you ask questions and you don't get a straight answer, you start to get concerned because you're wondering why aren't they telling it like it is? And rather than being concerned about getting an honest answer, we should be concerned about getting dishonest. Does that make sense? <laughs> dishonest answers. Um, and along those lines, the other big issue, another big issue that came up um, in this conversation about employment was, of course, uh, office politics. And there's so much wrong with the office setting itself, where you have this sometimes toxic environment. And again, unfortunately, I've worked in those settings as well. 
And the way to get ahead in that scenario is unfortunately and sometimes tragically backbiting, undermining other people, gossiping, and applying all these unwritten rules. And once again, without stereotyping, when it comes to autism, when it comes to neurodivergent individuals, they want rules. They want things to be clear. They want things to be official and structured and direct. And they often have a very hard time understanding why is it that this person said something a certain way and they got away with it or they were praised for it. I thought I said kind of the same thing. But the way I said it, people stared at me and gave me looks and I ended up having trouble as a result. And why is that? And no one can give an answer to that question. It's not as if we have a manual. It's not as if anyone gives you a rule book that says you can say it this way, but not that way. And to me, it reminds me of the struggles that younger children often have, you know, in the schoolyard, in the unstructured school time. And it's not uncommon for neurodivergent students to do quite well academically in school. But once they're out of the classroom setting, once they're out of that supervised environment, once they're in the playground, um, in the hallway even, that's when they often run into trouble because they're doing the right thing and people who are doing the wrong thing don't get the consequences that they should. Well, fast forward years later, now they're in the workplace and it's that same dynamic that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that can be just really, really difficult is being told you get onboarded right you're brought into the workplace you're told how things are supposed to work and then you're there for a few days and nobody's doing it that way <laughs> it's very confusing or what happens to a number of my clients they start a new job and they're expected to somehow just know how to do it they get about 30 seconds worth of training. The trainer runs away, doesn't want to deal with them anymore, and they're left having to figure it out and then getting in trouble when they didn't do it right. Um, I just think that so much of adult life can feel like a landmine field for the neurodivergent adult. It, it, even folks who have been for the most part able to kind of successfully navigate it it still kind of just leaves a, a, a distasteful sense in in your being that it does it does it even really have to be that way and now it's so ironic and really tragically ironic about what you're describing and you now i'm smiling not because i'm having smiling out recognition as you are because these are just things that you know we continue to see and it's so frustrating um but you know there's that and this is a stereotype and, and misunderstood altogether is that stereotype of neurodivergent individuals autistic individuals in particular not having empathy you know toward others um and without getting into what that means and why it's right. being misinterpreted and misunderstood well to talk about empathy you bring someone to the job, you give them two seconds of your script and expect them to know what to do. That doesn't sound very empathetic to me, and that doesn't sound like understanding someone else's way of thinking. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that's part of what feels very confusing. Um, when you grow up neurodivergent, often some of your earliest memories are being told who you are and the way you behave is wrong with very few good reasons for it. It's just the way it is. This is polite, that's not polite. Why? It's just the way it is, right? You know, wh why can't I stand up when I learn in the classroom? Because you're supposed to sit down, what? right? So there's so much just right away. Not only are we told we are wrong in who we are and how we would like to be, but we don't find very many environments or people who would like to accommodate who we are and how we want to be. And you know, we, we have a name for that in other settings, we call that discrimination. And that's really how I see it. And that was ultimately a point that came out in, you know, in the conversation about employment is that we are talking about discrimination as a very bottom line 
what's going on is saying that because of who you are, we're not going to hire you. And that's unacceptable, properly so, in other settings with other, we'll call minority uh, individuals. And in, we're talking about a neurological you know, minority, neurodivergent, neurodiverse community. Um, it should be unacceptable too. I think one of the things that goes a little sideways for folks, and you know, whether it's the classroom or the workplace or the grocery store or home, um, we don't have a society that that values helping one another mm -hmm. outside of extreme situations. You know, we love the stories of there was a flood and the whole town turned out. The, there was a tornado and the neighbors pitched in, right? We even love the hero teacher stories of, you know, they worked in a hard school and they put in the effort and their students succeeded. We, we cheer on and value the extreme, but not the day-to-day. -day. If, if I need something a little extra on the day-to-day, who am I to think I'm special, right? Why can't you just adapt? You need to get your stuff together so you can do the normal thing, right? When it comes to the, the mundane, the daily, we, we don't have society that values supporting one another in our success. Our success is ours alone to create. And I actually think that's exactly what we need. The, the, the response to that attitude is exactly what we need to move the needle forward when it comes to both education and specifically employment. Because, you know, as you suggest, people, many people are good people. Um, and they'll give charity, for example. And as you said, they'll be heroic. And if you have a one-time commitment, they'll be out there. If it's an emergency, they'll be out there. But we're not talking about a one-time commitment. We're not talking about charity because it shouldn't be charity. It shouldn't be seen as look at what I'm doing for you. You want a job, look how wonderful I am. It's all about me and I resent it because I have a business to run. I'm losing money, but you know what? I'm so great, I'll hire you. And I refer to that as a lose-lose because the employer is resentful. They're gonna give someone a job, but they're resentful that they have to, that they're paying this person money. And the employee gets it. Anyone can feel, anyone understands. And again, whatever job it is, it could be Einstein, it could be folding laundry, whatever job it is. If you're appreciated, you get it. And if you're not, it becomes very clear from your boss, from your coworkers. And there's really no point to that type. Uh, there's a place for charity, uh, you know, but the workplace is probably not it. Um, and for many, and these are generalizations, everyone's different, but for many neurodivergent individuals, the ask is not, do me a favor, do something for me. The ask is work with me. Let me do the job I'm capable of doing. And that's what I call a win-win because then the employer is happy because then they're getting someone doing the job that they need to be done. I don't know if employers like to pay anyone, but they get it. someone doing the job they want. It's worth it for them to pay that person's salary and they'll profit, they'll benefit from having that person on their payroll. And the flip side is even more important that the employee feels appreciated and they'll do that much of a better job in turn if they know that they deserve this job. And they do. They'll do a better job. They'll be more conscientious at work. They'll have a better attitude. And most of all, it respects the dignity of the individual. Yeah, I think um, there there's so many places in our experience, um, I'm thinking about medical experiences right now. Um, neurodivergent people are, uh, our life expectancy is, is between 15 and 20 years short of others. And it's not because we have m more physical problems, it's because we don't have good access to care. And in part, it's that same attitude. Um, who we are and what we need is maybe requires a little bit more thought, a little bit more tension, a little bit more explanation. Um, and we don't have a society that prizes that level of engagement um, almost on any level. Uh, 
we don't have uh, TV shows that that show the marriage relationship as anything but a bicker and a, and a pain, right? Um, we just don't have a society that that values effort in relationship. Mm. But I also think that because of that, the amount of effort is imagined to be a, a kind of a Herculean task, right? Oh, if I hire somebody who needs me to explain things, that's just going to be so hard and too much. And I don't have time for that and all of that. That might be valid, depending on how you're wired, right? However, neurodivergent people are often really good at teaching people how to help them, right? I have a physical therapist who I just think is the most wonderful person because in the first session or two, he would say things like, Don Marie, come and stand here. And I hesitate. And I finally realized, oh, right, I need, I need to tell him what I need. Because when he said, come here and stand here, I didn't know how I was supposed to land. Right. I could come and stand, but in pointing in what direction, near, far, like I, I needed more definition in order to be able to comfortably accomplish come stand here, which isn't the thought process of other people, but it is mine. Right. And I said to him, I need you please to give me as detailed and specific instruction as you can. And he kind of cocked his head and looked at me and he said, oh, okay. Come stand here, turn your back, you know, feet here. This is what we're going to do. It was brilliant. And it took like a couple of seconds yeah. for him to recognize what I need, figure out how he was going to do it and get it done. Now, not everybody is going to be wired for that kind of success. So we might have to trial and error, mm -hmm. right? Okay, you told me to come here and you told me to... Put my back to you but now i'm super uncomfortable because i don't know what you're going to do with my back to you right so a little trial and error and how you explain things to me but if you're invested in my success right. that's a that's a productive spending of time it is not a waste of time and you know it's funny just uh and again we'll leave to another time of full in-depth discussion of joseph and the character and the story but if you're familiar with it, what's fascinating to me is that there's this whole course of events. Joseph approaches Pharaoh, the king of the Egyptian empire, interpreting his dreams. And what's interesting is Joseph is somewhat, in my reading, and I think this is a fair reading, he's somewhat awkward in the way he talks to Pharaoh. It's the interview, he says the wrong thing, that kind of thing. But Pharaoh overlooks it, and Pharaoh accommodates him and gives him the supports that he needs, and he succeeds. And as you said, sometimes we need those stories. And sometimes one of the reasons I'm pleased to draw on that story is that sometimes it is those stories that's so much more effective than, you know, insisting on bringing a lawsuit. And, sorry. No, that's okay. I love it. Yeah, she's um, she can say hi if she wants. She's her little chair. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but sometimes it really is a tweak sometimes it is just making the extra effort of appreciating what this person needs what your employee needs what this student needs um and as you said sometimes it's a very big effort and that's the calculus of an employer they might make that decision i'm not up for it it's not worth my time not worth my investment but they may be pleasantly surprised that sometimes going the extra mile for your employee and this is true across the board in many different areas sometimes that can also pay off in very substantial and real life tangible you know financial returns if that's what the employer cares about and i get it you know we all get it, that when people are running a business they're not doing it to help others sometimes it's a win-win there sometimes you can do good and do well at the same time but we understand that most people are running a business to be fair to them they have to keep the business going they have to think about the profit shouldn't be all about profit, but that's got to be somewhere at the top of their agenda. And hopefully more and more employers will recognize that it is worth that extra effort. You know, sometimes we talk about, and you kind of alluded to this, we kind of talk about universal de uh, design, that sometimes making these efforts can benefit everyone. That's not always the case, but it's often 
available to an employer that if they provide certain types of supports called them accommodations everyone will benefit from it including your divergent individuals and including others in other contexts as well and that's well worth the expense again sort of back to the idea of um success and isolation mm -hmm. i think um as much as the diagnostic criteria for autism is uh social discomfort and um more comfort being alone and all of those things i don't think that that is an accurate representation for the average neurodivergent person. I think we crave community, we crave connection. Uh, we just don't have it in ways that work for us the way general society is designed. So uh, where we might enjoy clothes shopping, we may not enjoy crowded, disorganized, noisy, weird like right there may be lots of things we don't enjoy it doesn't mean we don't want to go get clothes right <laughs> and if we find a store that is organized and clean and makes sense and people are kind and you're not elbow to elbow with everybody and the lighting is pleasant like we will shop at that store we will be loyal right we will be your best customer we will tell other people about you right so it again back to this idea of um is it really a disordered way of being a disabled way of being or are we not finding the environments where we are able to participate um there's a i think it was new yorker who took einstein's um little statement about ask a fish to climb a tree right um and then judge them on it and you'll think the fish is a failure right. uh well, fish aren't designed to climb trees you know ask the fish to swim mm -hmm. and you'll understand that the you know the fish does an amazing job look at that fish swim right um and yeah what you're pointing to kind of and you alluded to this before you know there, there's the big picture questions and debates about medical model and social model and like a lot of the debates about neurodiversity and within, unfortunately, divisions um, within the autism communities. Um, some of these debates are reflecting a reality, I think, we all have our opinions, that's somewhere in the middle. That there is a neurological, and you might call that, you know, medical aspect, certainly to neurodiversity, different than neurological makeup, um, but there's undoubtedly a social aspect to the way a majority, and here too, I, I return to that notion of a minority. If the majority treats minorities, whatever form of minority existence a certain way, that's going to change that minority experience. And all too often, if not typically, it's going to change that experience in a negative way. So when you look at comorbidities, for example, when it comes to autism, you mentioned different health issues and even lifespan much of those realities are not a result from all we can tell of a neurological condition because they're really unrelated but they're much more likely it seems to be the result of the way society is treating this individual if someone's told as you said before tragically from the time they're young who you are is wrong the way you are is wrong but what's that going to do to someone's psychological makeup? What's that going to do to someone's ability to keep bouncing back? And it's remarkable to me how often autistic people are actually very resilient because they have to be. Um, but at some point, if you're told time again from a very young age that you do things the wrong way, I can't tell you why. I'm not going to tell you why. I'm going to you know, hide the ball. and <laughs> but. I, I once heard someone say, well, I've heard more than once, um, this saying that it's like being told that you're not following the rules, but we're not going to give you the rule book. So if that's the reality, it's tragic and unfortunately unsurprising 
when we have comorbidities like OCD and anxiety and you know, similar situations that arise. And you know, th these are these are so tragic to talk about things like suicide rates and that kind of thing, but they're realities that we have to acknowledge so we can put them forward. I think one of the things that uh, confused me most growing up and well into adulthood, and very sincerely still does, I have never understood the perspective of enjoying someone struggling, hmm. of withholding help, hmm. even as a benefit, right? They have to toughen up. They have to, you know, they've, in order to survive this world, they, you know, withhold help, withhold affection, withhold attention. And if somebody still seems to need it, then criticize them for the need. It's never made sense to me. Um, I don't, I don't see it uh, working in any environment. Um, I'll use sports for this analogy, right? To me, it would be like if you want to train somebody to be a quarterback on a football team, right? One of the jobs is to throw the ball. And you tell them they have to throw the ball and you never explain how to throw the ball, right? But that's their job, throw the ball. You, you give them the ball, you tell them, hold the ball, throw the ball, but not how, right? Some people are gonna take that ball and they're gonna be like, ooh, I was born to do this. And they just know, they just know, put their fingers on the laces, they, you know, they cock, they throw, they, and, and it's good, right? And we praise them. You are amazing because you naturally got it with no help from anybody. You take somebody else who doesn't have the same innate talent, but they have ability if taught. And we don't praise that. We praise the person who doesn't have to work on it. We don't praise the person who's willing to put in hours and hours of effort and research and study and thought and exercise and right we only praise that if they came in a movie right <laughs> <laughs> they have to have like disney or pixar or somebody like framing their experience to pull the right emotions out of us when it comes to our regular life if somebody needs instruction, if they need some patience, if they need extra help. We shove them aside, they are, they are a problem, and we take this from birth to grave. And, you know, it's fascinating to me that you describe that experience the way you do, um, because again, without stereotyping or over idealizing, and I would never speak for anyone else, but you know, as you described, and I've seen this so often, Many, many autistic people don't have that, whatever you call it, the gene of wanting to put other people down. Mm -hmm. The feeling, that trait, whatever you call it, of taking pleasure in other people's struggles, as he described it. Um, just, just don't have it. Just don't see the need or the interest and far from the joy and wonder why wouldn't you help someone else? Now, you can't help everyone, not everyone can do everything themselves or help everyone else and there's so much time but just the attitude of resenting someone for having needs resenting someone for needing help and i've experienced more patience in autistic individuals and i'm not sure you know i don't think any of us understands exactly why there's so much to learn there's as much as we do now there's so much we don't know but descriptively i've experienced a lot more patience from autistic people who are able to sit there and help other people and listen to other people and enjoy along with other people and root for them uh, versus 
people who are just, uh, you know, looking out for themselves and resenting anyone who kind of gets in their way or isn't on their page and what they want to accomplish. Yeah, and I think it comes down to what we are going to decide, how we're going to decide to move forward together. All, all types of individuals. Um, we understand the need for, we will all be better if we all work together when we're piling sandbags ahead of a flood, mm. right? Um, I, you know, I'm old enough, um, people my age could potentially start humming the piece of music that goes with the iconic barn raising in the movie, right? Like, we, we have, yeah. for all of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Um, but like, we have these images of, of working together that we find so inspiring and so brilliant and so valuable in moments of high need or very specific community. And so I think one of the things we can do if we're going to legitimately try to find diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just at work, but in all aspects of our lives, if we're going to really try to establish that, we have to start thinking more about Yes, how we succeed as individuals, but isn't there a component of community that benefits me? If I add to the whole in my way, in an effort to benefit all of us, aren't we all benefited? Mm -hmm. And we can see a, you know, if you enjoy capitalism, there's a concept of compassionate capitalism for a reason, right? We don't have to live as a socialist, though we can if we choose, right? We don't have to live as a socialist to recognize, actually, everybody does better, including the bottom line. If people are more comfortable at work, if people are more supported in their home life, if people have access to education, healthcare, those sorts of things. We don't have to agree on whether or not the government should do it, right? We can have different ways of doing it. But wouldn't we be better served as a culture if we start looking at how do we succeed together versus how do we succeed as individuals? And this very specifically would benefit the neurodivergent community because we, we actually need more than just us. Well, I appreciate that because, you know, and I mentioned such an honor, you know, to be in conversation with you. Um, I often emphasize that I'm a proponent, you know, of nothing about us without us. I think for all kinds of reasons. Um, but I also think it's important that it not become us versus them. Because uh, no one can do anything on their own. And I'm pleased to be an ally, you know, for that reason and an advocate for that reason. Um, and again, I'd never speak for you, I'd never speak for anyone else in this uh, lived experience, um, but I think everyone can bring something to the table. Um, and some of what I'm speaking about is drawn from my work as a lawyer. You know, when it comes to employment, when it comes to education rights, um, people often say to me, oh, doesn't the law say ABCD? Don't we have an ABA? We've had for 32 years. Um, and as a lawyer, I can tell you I'm well familiar with the good and the bad and the ugly of the law and the limits of the law. And your point about everyone benefiting is so important because if you tell an employer the reason you should hire this candidate is because if you don't, you'll get in trouble. Because if you don't, then we'll go after you based on the ADA or based on you know whatever employment law. They're gonna dig in their heels and they'll find a way to avoid getting caught. That's just the nature. I was a criminal prosecutor. I understand how that all works. And when it comes to forms of discrimination, people are very good at avoiding getting caught. They'll find a way around it. If someone wants to discriminate, they will. They'll find a way to say, well, the reason I didn't hire this person had nothing to do with the way 
they communicated in their interview. It had all to do with, uh, oh, that position was filled. Oh, it turned out we didn't really need someone to do that job. Or in the workplace, they'll target that person. And they'll have a file and document every single thing that an employee does wrong. So when it comes to the question of, are you discriminating? No. The reason I let this person go, I can show you A, B, C, D. So I don't think that's the way for it to work. I think we really do have to change hearts and minds, and we really have to demonstrate and get employers to have a different mindset and to understand, as you said, that they're better off, that they benefit, that their bottom line benefits, and so does the employees, and so do the coworkers. You'll have a better workplace environment. You'll have a less toxic environment if you don't accept that the person who gets ahead is going to be the person who says nasty things about everyone else and then takes a three-hour lunch or finds a way not to do their work and imposes it on the autistic employee who's like, well, I guess I got to do this job because, you know, my superior told me I got to do it. And that's what's wrong among many other things. Um, but that's one thing among many that we can move in the right direction. I really appreciate that you have devoted so much time and thought to these issues. Um, I think that it's really important to hear from as many different sectors of life as we possibly can. Um, you know, having your legal background, being, you know, being creative and an author, um, being a, a, an educator, you have these unique opportunities to see the world. Um, and you have chosen to to look at the world and, and evaluate this unique corner of it. And I really, really appreciate that. Thank, um, you. Thank you. Do you have a sense of what drew you? Um, I've had experience both personally and professionally with autism, with disability rights uh, for some years. Um, turns out I also have a rabbinic background, which is what drew me to the story of Joseph, besides just being curious and having seen the movies and such. Um, and it was kind of that combination of knowing the Joseph story and having more and more familiarity. And as we as a society start to learn more about autism and neurodiversity. Now, 20 years ago, I probably would not have had that aha moment because 20 years ago, speaking for myself, certainly, um, you know, I probably saw the movie Rain Man 20, 30 years ago, and that was kind of my understanding. I think we've made, you know, great progress. Um, still ways to go. But with the better understanding and more people I met, and you, you know, you've talked about the adult diagnosis, which is becoming much more prevalent, you know, 30 years ago when adults, 40 years ago when they were children, and I think there was no thought to diagnosis at the time. It does open up your eyes and open up your mind to understanding what we mean by autism and neurodiversity. And I had my aha moment with Joseph and I had my aha moment with coworkers. And as you kind of alluded to as well, um, in a lot of companies, there are programs that are officially designed to recruit autistic talent. But in some of these companies, and I won't name names, but in one company in particular with one of those programs, I know someone at the company who was never diagnosed and kind of self-diagnosed and then got an official diagnosis. And that person had been the company for many years, not through a hiring program for this individual. The person made it through the process and was very talented, is very talented, very good at their job. And they took to that program. They really appreciated that program because we're now developing that benefit where A, some companies at least are recruiting and there's ways to go there too. Some of it's more PR than actual uh, practice, but we're also at that point where employees who were hired without any sense of, oh, hire them because they're neurodivergent, hire them because I'll check a box or something. They were hired just because, just because they could do the job, which would be nice. Um, they're taking this notion and appreciate. And so I've seen a lot of that, and that has really informed my understanding of uh, Well, that's wonderful. Um, one of the things that I saw on Twitter this morning made me think of you. Hmm. Somebody 
tweeted out that they were gathering if you could ask for a bit of information from the world as a as a neurodivergent person like what would it be great if you had an instruction manual on you know and there were so many ideas but well you know one of them was i have no idea when i need a lawyer how i get a lawyer who i get and i don't think this is unique at all to the autistic community yeah. <laughs> but we've got a couple more minutes and i bet it, because you are an attorney you might have a little bit of an idea of how to share with the folks watching a, a little piece right we could do an entire hour on just that um mm -hmm. And so I don't want to minimize what I'm asking of you, but you know, if somebody really just might get shut down in their concerns over, I'm going to do this wrong. I, I don't know who I should call. I don't know who should I talk to. Should I tell my lawyer I'm autistic? Should I, right? There are a lot of fears we have picking up the phone to talk to anybody. Right, right. Um, and as you said, that's not unique. The, the need, for information is not unique in any means, you know, to autistic individuals or community. Um, and the reluctance to call someone when you have a problem. I mean, who wants to call the doctor? Who wants to call a lawyer? Who wants to call your car mechanic when you have trouble, right? So you, you don't want to do any of these things when it comes to doctors and lawyers, and I draw the analogy to doctors, because I think we all understand well, doctors have done a pretty good job we are educated in the notion that if something's bothering us, we go to the doctor and we give them as much information as possible. You mentioned, you know, if you go to a PT and you want to tell them as much as you can, and I'm not sure about the confidentiality there, but doctors certainly have very strict view of confidentiality and so do lawyers. And they can only help you if you give them as much information as possible and it's uncomfortable. When you go to a doctor, no one wants to tell them everything that's going on. Um, but you have to, because only then can they actually help you, diagnose you, figure out what's wrong, and figure out the way forward. The same is true about lawyers. And um, like anyone else, there are good lawyers, there are not so good lawyers, there are really bad lawyers. And there are two, there are good doctors, and yeah, not so good, and, and you know, it runs the range. But I will say that if it doesn't feel right, you know, if your arm is bothering you and it's lasting for a while, usually you'll go to a doctor and usually you'll describe what happened. And if it's your fault and you feel silly, you'll still tell them what happened. You won't hold back because if they don't know the facts, that's going to limit how much they can assist you. And the same is true about a lawyer. And disclosing, there's all kinds of issues regarding disclosing employers, of course, um, you know, real issues. and complex uh, considerations. That should not be a consideration when it comes to a lawyer. You should feel free to disclose of criminal defendants in the area that I teach, that I've worked in. Criminal defendants tell their lawyer everything they've done. If they're smart, they tell their lawyer all the bad things that they've done because only then can the lawyer help. So if there's something embarrassing, if there's something you want the lawyer not to mention, you can certainly make that very clear. And the lawyer is bound by the duty of confidentiality. And when it comes down to it, if you're just not comfortable with disclosing and you tell the lawyer, do not bring this up, do not mention it, the lawyer has to abide by what you tell them. But it's more likely you'll have a conversation with the lawyer and the lawyer will explain exactly, a good lawyer will explain to you, well, if we disclose, then here's the possible outcomes. There may be advantages. There may be legal opportunities that otherwise would not be available. We may be able to bring a discrimination claim where if we don't mention your autism, you're not going to have access to that claim. So I would encourage, with a caveat, and I've said this, but I'll repeat, the law is far from perfect. The law reflects society. Society is far from perfect. So I hope no one goes out with the expectation of, oh, all I need is a good lawyer and I'm going to win. That's not reality, but you can go to a doctor and they're not going to necessarily help you either. And when it comes to the law, there's the other side, right? You have an adversarial system. 
So if you hire even a good lawyer, well, the employer or the school system, whoever it is that's denying you your rights, is going to hire their own good lawyer. So your chances are obviously going to be limited on that basis as well. But yes, um, I would encourage anyone who thinks things are just not right, whether it's in the school, and I would say don't listen to the reassurances, you know, that just don't sound right either. And the same thing at work. If it doesn't sit right, if you, if you have the feeling that there's just something wrong with the way you're being treated, and then the supervisor or the boss says, oh, no, no, nothing to worry about, well, I would say you should trust your intuitions and at least speak to a lawyer. Strategically, hopefully the lawyer will know how to respond. Because sometimes you want a lawyer who's going to be gung ho and just go out there and fight. Sometimes that's going to cause the other side to respond in kind. So one more point, and I'll close on this. When it comes to lawyers, um, a good lawyer knows not only what you're fighting for, but also how to fight for it and what strategies and tactics to use. And sometimes you can work with the other side and you're better off in that regard. Sometimes you have to just fight the other side and that's the only choice you have. Thank you for going through that explanation. I really appreciate it. I, you know, I think there's uh, attorneys are those things that you're grateful you have them when you need them, but you hope you don't need them. <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of places in life where uh, attorneys are necessary and not, nothing's wrong, right? We buy houses with attorneys. We create our wills with attorneys. We, we set up uh, financial trusts with attorneys, right? Lots of, lots of things can, uh, can require the assistance and knowledge of, a, of an attorney that are not bad. Um, but we're often just not, we don't have any of that explained, you know? Um, and so I appreciate that you were willing to go through some of that because, you know, even just sort of hearing someone's reassurance, my favorite thing that you said was to trust your intuition. I, I think we often grow up as neurodivergent people being told not to listen to ourselves, mm. that we are not trusty, trustworthy within our own being. Um, and that just isn't true. It just absolutely is not true. We may have a more simple way of looking at life sometimes. We may need more nuanced uh, discussions and disclosures and things like that, right? We may have some needs, but that in no way means our ability to understand our inner being and our gut reactions and our intuitions and our way of viewing the world. We don't need to think of ourselves as wrong. We need to find the people who understand where we're right so they can help us affect the life we're trying to create. Um, and so I, you know, I think what you say, what you said about, you know, if something doesn't seem right at work, something doesn't seem right at school, at least ask a question. You know, many attorneys will talk to you at least once. And, and there are public interest organizations as well. There's legal aid, there's disability rights organizations as well. Um, I wouldn't speak for them or, you know, suggest that they're always going to take cases. But most of the people, certainly in my experience, who work in these organizations are doing it for all the right reasons. They're doing it because they care. They're doing this as a con, as a mission on their part. Um, again, doesn't mean they're going to be the nicest people always. And doesn't mean they'll have the time for you always. They're overburdened like the rest of us. Um, but in my experience, you're more likely to at least get a kind response and maybe you know, a listening ear um, from people who work in this field mm -hmm. uh, than in some other areas of law. Yeah. Well, Samuel, thank you so, so much for your time. I'm really, really grateful. It's been a great conversation. Um, so many different viewpoints and, and ways of looking at this topic and you've shared really, really well in all of it. So thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure and an honor, as I said.